Today on Blue 58, we take your questions on anything and everything that's on your mind related to the NFL Draft. Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast of thepowersweep.com. I'm your host, John Meerdink, and I am happy to be with you here for another episode. I thought it would be a good idea, now that we've done weeks and weeks of draft stuff, to get some of your thoughts or maybe your questions about this. So I've been soliciting your input for this episode over the past week or so. This is what we've got, about 20 questions. I'm going to try to get through them, as many of them as we can. Maybe we'll end up having to come back and do more next week. Maybe some of these will spark more questions. I don't know. We'll see. But I, I thought this would be fun to do. So we're just going to sit down and take a bunch of questions and see where things end up. This is roughly in chronological order that I received them. Not quite entirely, but um, we'll try to get to everybody that we can, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll answer a bunch of your questions here, starting with Old Packers Fan, who asks in our Discord server, does the Andre Dillard signing impact the Packers draft on day one or two? I think they envision Dillard as offensive tackle depth and maybe a Yash Nyman replacement. A day one starter at offensive tackles probably drafted before pick 25. So what will be the early positions drafted for the Packers? I don't think this has a big impact on what they would plan to do. What I think Andre Dillard is, and we'll, we'll probably talk a little bit more about him after the draft, but I don't want to spend a whole lot of time talking about him as a player right now. But as a concept, I think it's pretty clear that he's basically just a depth signing. He's the sort of guy that you sign so you have a backup plan if things go really badly for you in, in the draft. We talked a little bit about this in the, the offensive line episode. It's possible where the Packers are sitting that things are just not going to go well and there's going to be a run on offensive linemen or something that's going to make the dra- the draft not shake out the way in a way that benefits the Packers, which happens sometimes. We mentioned it happened at wide receiver in 2020. These things are random. You don't really know how they're going to go. So signing a guy like Dillard gives you at least a, well, we've got another body sort of option if you miss out on an offensive lineman at the top of the draft. If they don't, end up getting a a starting tackle, and they can't get an offensive lineman prospect they like early on, at least they've got Dillard in the mix with whoever they end up picking later. It obviously puts more pressure on whoever you end up picking later. As to who they're exactly going to pick, uh, individual guys, it gets tough, but I think position-wise you're going to be looking at offensive line, maybe defensive back in terms of what's going to be available there. We'll see. Um, But I, I think looking at big bodies early is my feeling most years and seems especially apt this year looking at what the Packers really need. Rudy, the good question asker, pops in with question one of two. The Packers have a plethora of picks this year, possibly even too many to use. The Packers host the NFL draft in Green Bay in 2025. To what degree do the Packers care about the performance of the 2025 draft? Is it 0%? Or is there a non-zero percentage of them that says we're at least moderately interested in packaging picks this year to get good early round picks next year when we're picking on our own stage? Is there a history of draft host cities swinging bigger in their home draft than they ordinarily might? This is an interesting question, and I think the answer is that it's not zero, but I don't think they trade picks this year to make a bigger splash next year. What I think we can say for sure is that the Packers not that they would ever be super interested in doing this because this is not really a thing that they do. Next year of all years, they're not going to not have a first round pick. Whatever it it whatever happens, they're going to make sure they are picking in the first round next year because that's that's the big send off or the big the big celebration moment for the Packers having the draft in Green Bay next year. And it's kind of the legacy moment for Mark Murphy, whose legacy really should be pretty well established by this point. Successful transitions from two Hall of Fame quarterbacks to their successors, successful as Jordan Love's era can be to this point. Let's, let's, you know, mute the praise a little bit there, but they've, they've managed the transition. They've put themselves in a really good spot to be successful with Jordan Love. Let's say that. Favre to Rodgers was a success. Rodgers to Love looks like a success so far. Uh, He's put them in good financial situation. He's brought the draft to Green Bay. We've we've run down his accomplishments before, but there, this is his last big thing for the Packers. So I think there is still some aspect of making a splash, though, and there are some. There is at least one example of historical precedence for some off-field stuff affecting the draft. 
in that one example that I know of, in 2013, the Buffalo Bills were going to change their general manager. Buddy Mick, Buddy Nix was wrapping up his tenure as general manager. They were going to ultimately transition to Doug Whaley, but that was going to happen after the draft. And outgoing GM Buddy Nix reportedly wanted a legacy pick. And what better position to cement your legacy as the architect of the Buffalo Bills, you know, now and forever, than getting a franchise quarterback? Except in the 2013 draft, there were really no franchise quarterbacks. That was a notoriously poor quarterback draft. Nevertheless, the Bills ended up picking E.J. Manuel in the first round, despite having a later round grade on him, because Knicks wanted the franchise quarterback, his final first round pick, to be his legacy. And what happens? E.J. Manuel starts 10 games as a rookie, but only seven over the next three years in Buffalo. Then he plays a single season with the Raiders, and then that's that. So as much as the Packers might like to make sure that they, they really crush the draft when it's on their home turf, making sure or, or trying to make sure that you crush the draft can have some some fraught propositions attached to it. I don't think they'll go that route. I don't think the answer is 0% either. Papa Roo asks, who's your favorite seventh round pick as a Packer? There's a correct answer here. Donald Driver is, I think, without question, probably the best seventh round pick in Packers history. Don't quote me on that for sure. It would be hard to argue with, I think, but maybe there's somebody I'm, I'm forgetting about from pre-1992 or so. Um, But I want to take this in a couple interesting, or maybe interesting to me, a couple other directions. Uh, The most frustrating but interesting seventh round pick that happened in my time covering the Packers is Jeff Janis, for sure. Uh, All the physical ability in the world just never really put it together on offense, but a dynamite special teamer, again, would be a perfect fit for the NFL's current return rules. Uh, It'd be almost a guaranteed thing, a, a big return from him. Uh, kick after kick after kick. The guy I thought would be good would be seventh round pick Kendall Donerson. All again, all the physical ability in the world. They never really end up making it as a special teamer at all. One guy I think about for no reason, a seventh round pick, James Looney, uh, a defensive end who kicked around as a sort of undersized three, four defensive end for a couple years in Green Bay before converting to tight end. It didn't work, but it's interesting that they tried. Another one that I think about a lot is Deshaun Wynn from back in 2007, a big running back. I guess I'm kind of like Brian Gutekunst in that I do like big running backs, and he's about as big as they come. Uh, Had a 72-yard touchdown run once. That's always exciting when you've got a 240-pound back sprinting three-quarters of the way down the field. And then the favorite whose autograph I happen to have is 2005 seventh-round pick Will Whitaker. 2005 was a rough season. The Packers were transitioning from um, Mike Sherman to whatever was going to come after Mike Sherman, even if Sherman... Uh, was not in on that at the time, was uh, kind of a lame duck coach there. They they knew they were going to make a change, but he had to ride it out anyway in 2005. Uh, they draft Aaron Rodgers, even though he's not going to, to be a part of their plans in the immediate future. They had to transition away from a bunch of guys, Darren Sharper, Mike Wall, Marco Rivera. It was going to be a rough season, uh, the big take, take your lumps year. And as a result, and we've actually written about this way back in the past on thepowersweep.com, uh, we called it the great guard disaster of 2005. Whitaker was a part of that. He started 14 games for the Packers in 2005 and never appeared in another NFL game. He had a couple short stints with some other teams, but he was not a, a long-term NFL player. But still, he was out there doing his best for 14 games, and his best was not very good. But a big dude and uh, got to start for an NFL team for an entire season, basically. The Jet Sweep guy asks, how would you decide on a draft choice if you were in charge? And as sort of a related question, so I'm grouping this together, Serb Packer asks, if you were a GM, what would a draft, what would be your draft philosophy? What does a team or best player available actually mean? But you can only choose one. So if you're going to to choose for your, your team needs or just go best player available, which do you do? How do you, how do you navigate this process? Basically, both these guys are asking. For me, I think it would just come down to trying to get as much data as possible, massive amounts of data. And I think as the general manager, what I would try to do as we're, we're going through this process is remove myself from as much as the, of the initial scouting process as possible. You need to build your infrastructure to help you as the general manager. You do not need to be the infrastructure itself. I don't think you need to spend as much time scouting these players individually as some of these general managers do. It's always big news when Brian Gutekunst or some other GM shows up at a pro day. That's what you got scouts for. 
they're there to collect data for you. You can get a second set of eyes on, on guys later in the process if you have to, but pro days are so controlled anyway. Just let those other guys kind of collect the data. You need to be sorting it. Your job as the general manager should be parsing all of the data everybody else collects, not scouting people individually, in my opinion. So once you've got all that data, how do you weigh it? How do you go through this process? Do you draft for needs or do you draft for best player available? You always want to go with the second one, ideally. But teams do draft for need, and fairly often. We've seen the Packers do it. We've talked about it in terms of what the Packers need each and every year. We're never going to stop doing that because that's how these things shake out. You draft for needs because you need need things. You need guys to fill roster spots. If the Packers just went down the board and picked the best player available and didn't come out of this year's draft with, say, any offensive lineman, that would be a problem. Uh, but you can't. You couldn't just go back to everybody and say, hey, we got the best player on our board with, with every one of our picks. Well, Jordan Love will sit there in September and say, thanks, boss, but you know, there's nobody here to block for me because Rasheed Walker got injured in training camp and now we have no tackles to back him up. We're in real trouble here. And you can have all these other best available players that you put on your roster, but you have a major hole. So you've got to draft for needs sometimes. But I think you always want to end up trusting your board more than swinging for needs. It's a lot easier to end up chasing if you're going for needs than if you're just drafting the best available player. And the thing that you never really want to do in the draft is chase. That's where you end up getting in trouble. It's it's really a different version of the the gambler's fallacy. Um, the gambler who believes he's got a, a sure thing or that he's due for something. So you make something that even worsens your odds of getting a good player. The data on this is pretty clear. Generally speaking, teams are not good at drafting. Nobody has an especially high hit rate. Even Ron Wolf, who is as good at this as anybody, talks about if you if you get three contributors from a draft, you've done a really good job. Um, most guys just are not going to have a super high hit rate. So if you're spending two or three picks to trade up and get somebody that you think is is either going to meet a need or actually is the only good player available at the time, chances are you're wrong. Uh, just the odds are not in your favor uh, of nailing that pick. Uh, as good as you may be at evaluating guys, you're, you're probably just incorrect there, because there's so many factors that can go into a player not working out, and so many of them are out of your control. All of them are out of your control, really. I mean, you can put a guy in a, in a good environment, but it's cultivating a young player's career is as much art as science. And and maybe not even art, it's more like mysticism or uh, magic or something like that. Some guys just don't come together. You look at some players who have all the potential in the world, who have who have all the, the tools necessary to be a great player in the NFL, and it just doesn't work out. Or maybe maybe they're not even a bad player, maybe they're merely good, or maybe they're merely just competent. Look at a guy like Darnell Savage. I don't think he's the worst safety in the world, but for what the Packers invested in him and what they needed from him from that draft spot, it didn't work out. And there's so many different factors that go into it. He's been injured a bunch. Maybe there was some position stuff that that didn't work out. He went through two different defensive coordinators. He had a bunch of different defensive backs coach. It it's it was not a ideal environment for him to grow. Heck, he, he had a pandemic in there in the middle of all that. I mean, we've talked about how the pandemic affected draft classes and stuff like that, the amount of guys coming out. It had to have some effect on player development, you'd think. Jordan Love lost his entire rookie year essentially because of the pandemic. I I don't think it's unreasonable at all to suggest that guys had a different learning experience than they would have otherwise just because they were involved in a pandemic early in their careers. I, I don't think we can discount the possibility of that playing out in somebody's career. So just don't chase is the big thing. Um, and I think that leads you back to the board and just trusting the board and, and trying to get the best players you can that also align with your needs. So it's a little bit of both, but just make sure that you're not chasing stuff. Chips asks, what was your most memorable draft and why? Two for good reasons, one for bad reason. 2005, the Aaron Rodgers draft is always going to be memorable for me just because of how hard it was for me to let go of the end of the Brett Favre era. I think that was a good learning experience for me as a still fairly young NFL fan, just just seeing how different things were coming together and planning ahead and then learning about the behind the scenes stuff, what people thought about Rodgers, why he fell, um, people talking themselves out of things. It was a it was a great learning experience as a fan, but just the shock of saying, 
all right, the clock is running on the the Favre era here. We we have to start looking to the future because I think it would have been 17 at the time there, not even 17 yet. Uh, just you're still in the I'm going to live forever. Everything's going to be great forever. Nothing's ever going to change sort of mindset. And then this is a very real reminder that there are people out there planning for the future five, 10 years down the road. Uh, I'm barely getting to the end of the next week planning wise as a, as a teenager at that point. Uh, big learning experience. 2013 is one that sticks in my mind because it was the first year I really went whole hog trying to cover it. This was back in the days when I was running uh, PackerPerspective.com or maybe even just PackerPerspective.wordpress.com at the time. I learned a lot from doing that. I learned that covering everybody is not a good idea and you're just going to burn yourself out if you try to write something about each and every undrafted free agent. Um, it was It was fun to get guys right in real time. Uh, the initial reaction I think I had on Mike Daniels was a little bit of surprise, but digging into him and, and researching him, it was easy to get excited early on, especially where the Packers picked them. Uh, Miles White, we actually identified as a contributor early on. So that was a good affirmation and, and a fun weekend from a, oh, I, I think I can do something doing this kind of work sort of moment. That was a lot of fun. And then in 2019, uh, I actually lost my job the Friday after the first round. So the 2019 draft starts on, on Thursday. The Packers make two picks. They get Rashawn Gary. They get Darnell Savage. It's super exciting. Uh, Friday morning is a slow day at work. Um, my wife is four and a half months pregnant. She's not feeling well. Uh, I figure um, I'm going to do some stuff around the office uh, and then head home for the day because I, I want to be with her. I want to make sure that she's doing all right. Uh, and then we'll get ready for the the second round of the draft and beyond. Uh, so I mentioned to my boss um, that I'm going to take off at noon, and an HR person happens to overhear me and says, "Oh no," um, and scurries off. And I thought that was a little bit weird. So I actually went back to my my office where I had this is the only job where I've ever actually had my own office. But I'm sitting down. I, I wrote something actually about Rashawn Gary uh, since I had nothing else going on that morning at work. Published it minutes after I hit publish. If it was five minutes, I would be surprised. Um, the HR person pops her head into my door and says, hey, uh, can you come with me for a second? Um, and she walks me down a long hallway. And on our way, the vice president of the company joins us. And I'm like, this is a little bit weird. And then we step into a conference room and she says, actually, we're, we're downsizing. We're going to have to let you go. So that led to a fun conversation with, with my wife that afternoon. Um, in the midst of the 2019 NFL draft. But I think about that every year at this time, just how thankful I am actually that that, in a way that that happened and just that amidst it all that I still get to do stuff like this and still am able to. Uh, but that certainly wasn't an, a, a memorable NFL draft. I will not forget the 2019 NFL draft. Uh, no Misery asks, uh, what is your all-star Packers draft team from 2000 until today? Which player would you take again in each of the seventh rounds on offense and on defense and why? Let's go through this real quick. 14 guys to talk about, a couple bonus ones in there as well. First round, I think, is Aaron Rodgers, as exciting as the start to the uh, the Jordan Love era has been. It's hard to beat a surefire fire Hall of Famer for MVPs. Aaron Rodgers is the answer on offense. No other first round pick has been as good as Aaron Rodgers, possibly in Packers history. It's it's real close. I mean, I mean it's probably actually not that close between him and and just about everybody else in Packers history. Paul Horning might be the the other answer as far as great first round picks, though there there have been others. But but Rodgers, I think, has a, a real claim as the best first round pick in Packers history, certainly since two thousand. Number two is a tough one. Uh, I go with Jordy Nelson here, though you could also uh, say Devontae Adams for sure. Um, but I like Nelson because he was a trade back, which is I think is an, an interesting bonus here. Um, the Packers ended up trading 30, the 30th overall pick to the Jets for 36 and for 113. And I'll give you a nickel if you can tell me who they ended up getting with the back half of that trade. I had to look it up. Um, 13, or they traded the 113th pick and a fifth round pick. I think it was like 160 or something like that for pick number 102 and ended up selecting, if you say it, say it, if you know it, it's Jeremy Thompson out of Wake Forest. He did not make a splash with the Packers, but that's who they got in the back half of the Jordy Nelson trade. Third round pick, I think is probably Jermichael Finley. I would love for it to be Tucker Craft at some point, but I think for right now, he's, he's my favorite pick at, in the third round on offense since 2000 unless I'm forgetting something, someone which could be possible. Fourth round pick is David Bakhtiari. That is an easy one. I think everybody would make that pick again. Also the result, I think, of a trade back. 
uh, uh, Ted Thompson was on one in the 2012 draft. Look at some of his trade backs. Check out the trade tracker at thepowersweep.com. Just amazing work in the 2012 draft. Uh, Bakhtiari, my fourth round pick, though. Fifth would be Aaron Jones. Huge value for where they got him in the draft. Actually, the second of three running backs the Packers took in 2017. Jamal Williams actually went ahead of of Jones. He was higher paid than Jones throughout their entire first contract with the Packers as a result of that. Just uh, an interesting way that these things work out sometimes. Sixth round pick, I'll take another running back with, in James Starks. Uh, a huge value again for where the Packers got him. John Runyon, probably a runner up there in the sixth round, though I think not as good at guard as Starks was at running back. Uh, when Starks was good, he was real good in Green Bay and a huge part of that 2010 Super Bowl run. And then in the seventh round, I think Matt Flynn is my pick since 2000. There there haven't been a ton of noteworthy picks in the 21st century in the seventh round, but hey, uh, Flynn was part of one of the most, a couple of the most entertaining games in, in recent Packers history. His uh, his record setting game at the, at the end of the 2011 season, his comeback win uh, in the second half against the, the Cowboys in 2013, two great moments. And if that's all you do in your NFL career, that is not too shabby. On defense, I think in the first round, I go Clay Matthews. Uh, another result of a trade, Packers actually trading up back into the first round to get him in 2000, uh, 2009. And actually, uh, they utilized the pick that they got from Brett Favre, uh, from the Brett Favre trade to do that. So that is a little bit of a, a bonus legacy there. Second round, uh, Nick Collins is probably my favorite second rounder on defense. If not for his neck injury, the 2005 draft probably goes down as a double Hall of Famer draft, which should cement Ted Thompson's legacy. But yeah, for as long as he was in Green Bay, Collins was outstanding and was seemingly still on the rise when he hurt his neck, which is just a bummer, obviously, for him. Uh, but for us as Packers fans, what we got deprived of just watching him and to say nothing of what it did to that Packers defense after their Super Bowl in 2010. Uh, third round, Morgan Burnett. Uh, if you can't have Nick Collins, I mean, Burnett is a pretty okay consolation prize, not not Hall of Fame track player at any point in his career, but very solid, did some versatile things. Another guy who helped me learn more about football, just seeing how he was deployed over the course of his season or his career. Uh, that was interesting to learn about and see. Fourth round pick, uh, Blake Martinez is probably my guy here, though Will Blackman is also a contender primarily for what he did on special teams. But I like Blake Martinez, probably a little bit harder on him over his career than was justified at times, but still um, a, a pretty solid linebacker for his time in Green Bay and a tackling machine. Uh, just don't maybe um, look at his his uh, Pokemon card company and all of that. Not an auspicious end to that career transition for him. Uh, fifth round pick, probably Micah Hyde. A couple other really good contenders here since 2000. Uh, you could go with Aaron Campman. You could go with Kabir Baja Biamila. Both very solid options. Hyde is a lot of fun. Also gets a special teams boost. Sixth rounder would be Corey Williams in 2006. They ended up trading him, I think, for a second round pick to the Cleveland Browns. That that pick ended up being Brian Brom, I think. So not a great ending there, but still was a good player. Vastly outperformed his draft slot and got the Packers an asset, even if Brom didn't end up being that great of a player. Then seventh round pick, don't really have a ton of options here. I would say Sam Barrington, fun player, thoughtful off the field. Um, just a, an interesting little player in Packers history there. Luke Woodford asks, after round one, what realistic outcome would make you the happiest and also what outcome would displease you the most? If the Packers came out of days two and three of the draft with a solid or like the back half of a solid double dip, or even if it's just like the second round and then the fifth round or something like that, a really solid double dip on the offensive line and a fun running back, mark me down as happy. Even I would take even a solid, a fun linebacker in place of the fun running back, just another guy to, to throw in the mix there. But if you come out of this weekend looking solid on the offensive line, add players at, at running back and linebacker, I'm I'm a pretty happy camper. I don't think there's a lot the Packers can really do wrong in this year's draft. Um, it's it's a really really exciting place for them to be in. But if they came out of the draft with no real offensive line depth, I think that would be close to GM malpractice. I don't think Brian Gutekunst will do that. I think he's aware of that 
I would hope he's aware of that. And I think they're as concerned about it as anybody. They just signed Andre Dillard. So certainly they are concerned about their offensive line. And I think we don't really have any worries there in terms of what's going to, to shake out on the offensive line because they're going to they're gonna get somebody. They've got to. No misery pops back into our question order here. Uh, which position would you be most upset if Gutekunst doesn't take a player in the draft? Which position are you most confident to skip? So we said a little bit about uh, offensive line already. Again, if they came out of this draft with no offensive lineman, that would be um, grounds for... If I was Brian Gutekunst's manager and he didn't draft an offensive lineman next week, I would want to call him into my office and be like, hey, this seems like a an obvious area for us to improve. Walk me through your thought process on this and maybe let's get on the, the personal improvement plan and make sure that we get some really intriguing uh, undrafted free agents because we need some help on the offensive line. Not something that worries me. They're going to take an offensive lineman. I would put money down on it. I won't, but I would. Um, hypothetically. I won't though. Uh, the most content to skip would be wide receiver. I would not be surprised to see them take a receiver, but if they don't, it's not the end of the world. I always want more pass catchers. I've always wanted more pass catchers. It's always been my favorite position to to speculate about in the draft, wide receiver and tight end, because wide receivers and tight ends are fun. Throw running backs in there too. You're always fun to have the new guy on offense and see how how great he's going to be and uh, pine about what could have been when you see the guy who ran a 4-3-40 turn out to not be any good at all. Uh, but hey, if they don't come out of the draft with a wide receiver, it's not going to bother me. It's not going to be the end of the world. Carl Anderson, when was the last time the Packers picked somebody you predicted and also were excited about? How did he pan out? And what would you guess the odds are of that happening again in this year's draft? And who would be that guy? Carl, very efficient there. Packs like four questions into two sentences. Well done. Uh, The first guy that I actually predicted going to the Packers uh, was Dayton Jones. And I was certain that he was going to be good. He just seemed like an ideal fit for what they were doing on defense. He seemed like a really motivated, driven guy. He seemed like he checked all the athleticism boxes. So in the 2013 draft, which we, we talked about before, I actually predicted that the Packers would take him or Star Latulale out of out of Utah. And he ended up, and, and Jones ended up being the pick. He did not pan out. Um, had some okayed seasons, uh, but was just not what they needed him to be as a first-round pick. Uh, which sometimes is a little bit unfortunate. Your expectations for guys change based on where you draft them. If he'd been a fourth-round pick, I think you'd be pretty happy with Dayton Jones and what he brought to the Packers, but he wasn't, so we weren't. This year, if I had to put down one player in the first round, let's do what we did for 2013 and do two, I would say, shoot, I'll, I'll, I'll put three in here. I think it's Cooper DeGene, I think it's Graham Barton, or I think it's Kool-Aid McKinstry. DeGene just makes too much sense. Uh, The Packers need a safety. I think he probably is a safety, but he could fill in elsewhere if they need him. He just seems to fit what they want from their defensive backs in terms of versatility and things like that. Historically, I'll add that very large caveat there because things may be changing under Jeff Jeff Halfley a little bit. Graham Barton just seems like a, a Packers pick. He's a guy who could play tackle, who could play guard. It gives you flexibility, especially on the right side of your offensive line. And then Kool-Aid McKinstry, I've seen more people talking about him lately. It just seems like he's the sort of fallback plan I could see the Packers taking. It seems like a sort of conservative pick to pick McKinstry. He's a guy who was solid in college, didn't have eye-popping athleticism numbers. Uh, But he seems like a a fairly safe pick. Uh, But defensive backs, you never really know. But between one of those three, I feel pretty solid about what the Packers are going to end up doing. If they had those three guys on the board, I would be pretty confident in thinking it was one of those three guys at 25. That's assuming they don't trade up. Yesaya asks, I think the Packers, or Gutekunst in particular, previously mentioned they want to keep drafting quarterbacks. If you were a general manager, would you draft a quarterback? And if so, who would you pick and why while considering our current needs? I would do this if the board breaks well for you on day three. Factors out of your control to be sure, but I, yeah, I think I would do this if I could. I think the idea of, of restocking at quarterback, especially when you're set further up the depth chart, is not a bad idea. It's not all that much more expensive, than, and it sometimes it's cheaper than going with an undrafted free agent. And at least with a, with a draft pick, you know you're getting your guy. Who would that guy be? I have not looked really at quarterbacks at all this year because I don't really care what the Packers uh, do at at that position. Um, 
they're they're pretty set again at the top of the depth chart. Jordan Love isn't going anywhere. Um, we're probably talking about paying him quite a bit of money here in a couple of weeks, uh, which is a good position to be in. So don't worry about that overly much. Uh, but if I had to pick a guy, it would probably be Gavin Hardison out of UTEP. The Packers have been poking around on him a little bit. It might just be medical stuff because he did have an injury late last season uh, and had Tommy John surgery, which is something you usually see from baseball players. Uh, but has a big arm, shows up on the highlights. The the counting stats are not great, but he has some arm talent there. I think this is a good example of a bet on physical ability and hope he figures it out type guy. He seems to have some significant physical ability and uh, is not too shabby in the mobility department either. If he's at least as good as Alex Magoo, you probably keep him around until next year when you can draft another quarterback and keep running this pipeline. And if he turns out to be anything at all, that's a worthwhile investment at the game's most important position. Third go-round here from No Misery. If you were the general manager, on whom would you rather roll the dice? A player with big production from a small college who dominated his not-so-impressive opponents, or on a player with underwhelming productivity numbers from a big college who played against other good players? Assume both are freak athletes. I thought this was going to be a harder question than it was, but as soon as I sat down and thought about it at all, I think it's the first one for sure. This is what I would rather do. I'd rather beat the or bet on the guy who played at a lower level and dominated than the guy who struggled against other good players. I don't want to have to make excuses for a guy right out of the gate. I don't want to to sit and and say like, look, this guy struggled or this guy didn't produce uh, despite having all the athletic ability in the world. I would rather sit there and talk about the guy who, yeah, I can say, sure, he played at a smaller level of competition, but he dominated that competition. He did a fantastic job. There are exceptions to that. I think both Christian Watson and Rashawn Gary fall into that both a little bit. Watson, you talk about being a a freak athlete who didn't necessarily dominate his level of competition, but has shown some promising things in the NFL, um, if, if a mixed bag due to injury. And Rashawn Gary kind of falls into that same category, too. Uh, for usage reasons, um, I think, at, at, at Michigan a little bit, not because of physical ability or effort or things like that, just was used in kind of a funny way. But I, I bet on the dominant guy who's a freak athlete over the guy who still isn't a, a competent football player, even if he's playing at a tougher level of competition. Yojo Mojo writes, under the idea that the game is won and lost in the trenches, the Packers would be wise to address their needs on both sides of the ball in the trenches. The true tackles in the draft are few and far between, leaving me to wonder if there might be a run and reach on players at the def- at the position. If Green Bay is unable to secure a starting caliber tackle, how might they pivot their draft strategy and how do they then go about improving the depth on their offensive line? In other words, what's plan B for addressing the offensive line? Plan B starts with guys like Andre Dillard. So you, you grab Dillard and you say, at least we've got some tackle depth now. Then you're just looking at more redundancy and, and depth from there, you're looking for guys that you could maybe move around. Um, there's a bunch of positional versatility in this draft, as we talked about on the on the offensive line issue or uh, episode. You can move guys around a lot throughout this class and find ways to get them on the field and be part of your best five. Um, if you can't get a starting caliber, caliber tackle, I might pivot and look pretty hard at spending a, a, a late first-round pick on a guard or even a center, as much as that would sting from a fan perspective, that's not a an exciting pick by any stretch of the imagination, but it is one that addresses some needs there. Uh, center is a, if not an immediate short-term need, a relatively short-term need if you don't get a starting caliber tackle because in in that case, Zach Tom is probably staying at right tackle. You might as well amp up the center competition then and, and put somebody at center who's who's you know, better than Josh Myers, because Myers, even if he holds down the job for this year, is probably not coming back after that. You could also make sure that right guard is shored up just by getting a guy with some guard experience. But um, you, you'd prefer to, if you're going to go with an, a, a tackle in the first round, you'd prefer to just get that settled right out of the gate and not have to go to plan B. But um, I think a, uh, a missing out a tackle early on or, or not being able to get a tackle early on because of a run or whatever uh, really increases the, the likelihood and necessity of going with more, just just volume, get more offensive linemen at whatever position they play. So if you, if you miss out on somebody early on, get ready to draft two or three or maybe even more than that 
throughout the later portions of the draft. Rudy, the good question asker, returns. Any reporting around artificial intelligence running any draft rooms in the NFL? Not so far as I know with the draft stuff, but the NFL is doing some interesting work with artificial intelligence. In early February, they announced they were working with Amazon's AWS service to introduce some machine learning into injury assessment resulting in something that they call a digital athlete. So what they do is they take a, uh, this is from a a news release about this or an article published at NFL.com, quote, they take ultra high resolution video and set the AI loose on assessing it. The AI model can then view any play from 38 different angles, 60 times per second. A computer vision algorithm looks at all the video data and identifies the core and extremities of each player on the field. The synchronized cameras enable the digital athlete to examine exactly when and where each player is in time and space. Using the data to identify each player, it then plots the positioning of player body parts in three dimensions. The plotted points are compiled into virtual player skeletons that track the exact positioning of each of the player's joints and movements over the course of every play. Tracking the position of a player's lower extremities throughout the play enables the detailed analysis of movements such as a player's gait over the course of a game, which can yield insights into whether fatigue may have contributed to an injury. End quote. There you have it. That's as much stuff as I've been able to find on AI stuff in the NFL, though I'm sure there is some other applicability for that out there. The Frozen Cheesemonger writes, Wild thought experiment. What if coaches and scouts were drafted, included in the cap, and participated in free agency? How might that impact the game? Maybe I just like the chaos. Questions like, do I put a coach or a wide receiver at this spot on my big board? Would it help balance the league to an even greater degree? I love the idea of chaos. Uh, that's my one of the sayings we come back to in the NFL draft every year is root for chaos because if you're at the end of the NFL draft or end of the first round, chaos is only going to help you make sure you get one of the guys that is higher on your board. I wouldn't necessarily do everyone like this at once, but I like the idea of thinking about having to hire scouts this same way. Maybe there's some real short-term or long-term thinking challenges in there. Do we need to r- replenish our... Uh, front office or um, add to our players on the field. I think it would accelerate the use of AI in the draft because you'd be looking to offset maybe some of your potential advantages um, or losses uh, from losing a scout or whatever in free agency. But uh, I don't think this is super likely uh, just because of how much longer you can play or how much longer you can do scouting stuff. But I don't, I don't know if it would balance the league anymore just because I think guys may not move around as much as, as you might think. But if you had to add them to the salary cap, uh, you never know. Maybe there's a guy who's just very elite at scouting a certain position and you want to make sure that you get him or he has extra connections to a certain area of the country. You want to make sure you add him to your staff. It's an intriguing idea. Let's put it that way. Corky Rabano fan throws this one out there. A couple of times this draft process, you've mentioned players that have played with current Packers. For example, Cooper DeGene and Lucas Van Ness are boys from South Dakota and Kraft. Now, certainly the scouts are watching them, but how much do you think they are or are aware of any examples of current players having input on draft selections? I don't think the players do, but I think you've, you've nailed it sort of in the middle there. Teams are influenced by seeing guys uh, and becoming aware of their teammates. This is something we've seen play out with Brian Gutekunst and his staff over the years. If they draft a player from a given school, within a year or two, they typically go back to that school for somebody else. They, they've often done that. And that could happen again this year. There's a few schools uh, from last year's draft where there, there are guys that the Packers have either been connected to explicitly or seem like they would be good fits for the Packers this year. Iowa, we had Lucas Van Ness last year, uh, but they've got Cooper DeGene and Logan Lee this year. Oregon State. Uh, Kitan Oladapo uh, at safety is an option there. There's an additional connection there of uh, Packers quality control coach Anthony Perkins coaching Oladapo at Oregon State for the the past couple of years. South Dakota State, our question asker talked about that a little bit. You've got Mason McCormick, the offensive lineman, and Isaiah Davis, the running back. Penn State connections, Curtis Jacobs at linebacker. Kentucky, I think, is the strongest option here with Ray Davis and Trevin Wallace, both of whom the Packers have had in for visits. So even if the players aren't openly advocating for them, and and I don't think uh, Brian Gutekunst would necessarily listen, even if they were, I, I, I think there is some idea of guys getting scouted the Packers drafting them, say in the case of Lucas Van Ness or whatever at Iowa, and then being more aware of these other guys and maybe slightly biasing themselves toward that because they've they've seen all these other guys on film 
playing together. It would be hard to avoid that sort of thing. But generally speaking, they're, they're coming from good schools anyway, so that's not that big of a deal. Chris B. asks, hey, John, hope all is well. Here's my question. It is all well. Thank you for asking or for including that. Let me start with the cliches of all cliches. Drafting quality players in the NFL is hard. It is. After having a handful of mostly busts with a couple of booms mixed in, it looks like Goot absolutely nailed the last two drafts. Glass half empty. Goot just got lucky. Glass half full since the last couple of drafts have been more normal than the COVID drafts. It has allowed Goot accounts to get dial in in, uh, and portends well for the future. I know you're usually a glass half full guy. Appreciate you saying that. I don't know if that's true. (laughs) What do you think? Um, I think he did do really well for himself in both 2022 or 2023. I don't even think that's being overly optimistic. The COVID stuff is hard to get a handle on, but it definitely has been a factor in in a bunch of different areas of the draft. The shape of guys' careers are very different. Some guys didn't play at all in 2020. Some guys played less. Some guys moved around a lot more from school to school. The The NIL stuff. Um, is a related factor there. We don't have to go into that now. But we are just getting to the point where we're starting to emerge from the the tidal wave of these COVID drafts where you have a lot more guys coming out because of staying in school longer. Things are starting to get more back to normal. And I think that does help Gutekunst and also other teams evaluate better because you have just more time to spend on a smaller draft pool. I think what's really happened the last two drafts is that Gutekunst has gotten a much better base here. They, they don't really have that many roster spots that they need to fill, really, in this year's draft. They've got 11 picks, and a good number of them probably won't make this year's team. But the, the talent base thing is huge. 2023, obviously, as a class, speaks for itself. Uh, contributors at all levels there. 2022, not quite as good, uh, but still very solid. You've got a genuine stud, I think, in Zach Tom. Uh, guys that are generally plus players in Quay Walker, Devontae Wyatt, even Romeo Dobbs. And if Christian Watson can steady things out at all, he becomes a huge asset, even as of right now. Disappointing is a hard word for it. I think it's fair, though. Let's just say disappointing to this point. I think he would be disappointed in his NFL career to this point. Um, Even if he has been disappointing, it's not like he hasn't been a useful player at times. Uh, It's just the, the consistency there, and it's just the injuries and stuff like that. But when he's on, he's on. And there are few players in the NFL who produce in bunches like Christian Watson is capable of doing. If he's right this year, and if he plays like the guy that he was in the second half of 2022, then that 2022 class looks outstanding. Um, But even even so, you've got two really solid draft classes, and it does position Gutekunst and the Packers really well for both the present and the future. KCN writes in about a player that we did not cover. Malik Mustafa is a safety prospect that scored a 938 relative athletic score and seems to be a physical downhill tackler. I don't remember you touching on him during your draft preview for the position. What kept him off your list? He did not test at the combine. And I actually didn't circle back to get him before the safety episode, but he did test really, really well at his pro day. So let's talk about him real quick now. Uh, at a Wake Forest, a, a smaller guy, not not just huge, 5'10", 209 pounds, so not the biggest safety in the world. But as our question asker said, 938 relative athletic score, coverage grade of 72.1, 18 ball hawks in his college career. That would paint him, uh, judging by the, the thresholds that we used, as a very solid Tier 2 prospect. Snap alignments paint him as a box guy. I tend to think the Packers are going to try to find another Isaiah McKinney type guy so they can more mix and match. Uh, rather than on dialing in on the two specific roles. But I think he's a real good prospect. The good stuff, a borderline tier one guy, pro football focus, has him, as we, we mentioned here in the question, as one of the better run defenders among safety in our, safeties in our sample. The bad is going to be size stuff there, described as over-aggressive by some, but you're looking at a day three player here. Um, seems like a, another solid option at safety, and we'll have him on our big board as a tier two prospect. Don T., asks, quick question regarding Zach Tom that I haven't heard anyone else talking about. I'd hope the Packers would move Tom to center prior to last season, but it didn't happen. Then he went out and established himself as a high-end right tackle, which makes me wonder if he'd now be receptive to switching from a high-paid position uh, to a lower-paid position. But if they can't force, surely the Packers can force him to play center for the next two years if they want, but they can't force him to resign with them. 
And if another team wants to throw a tackle size contract after, at him after his rookie deal expires, is it realistic to expect that he would opt to stay around for less money to play center in Green Bay? So there is a significant difference here in money. Uh, according to Spot Track today, uh, just looked it up, this up this morning, seven centers were making a double digit average annual salary heading into the 2024 season. That's probably going to drop to six when Jason Kelsey, assuming he retires, probably retires. But just in terms of the double-digit money threshold per year, there are 28 tackles making that much. So it would potentially cost Tom money working from right tackle to center. We are looking way ahead here, but things could get fairly complicated because the Packers could franchise tag him, but how do you tag him? If he plays center for two years after playing tackle for two years, it could end up being a fight. What might end up happening here is the Packers, if they play him at center and if he ends up you know, doing as well as they supposedly think he can do, if he ends up um, playing at a high level there, the Packers could just um, end up making him an exceptionally highly paid center, which if he's as good as they seem to think he is, would not be the worst thing in the world, but would be a complication to be sure. The Frozen Cheesemonger asks, was the Packers-Cowboys game last year the best performance of the season? Everything seemed to be firing on all cylinders. How can we reproduce that effort? I don't think it's an effort thing. I think it's probably the Packers just lining up really well to attack the Cowboys and, and hitting on everything. It's not that they played, I think, that much better in that game than any other game. I think that they were at least as good the previous week against Minnesota, um, but it, it or uh, two weeks prior, I guess, uh, it was Chicago in the final week of the season. But it just it came on the biggest stage and against probably the best team that they played or one of the best teams they played to that point. Uh, it just it ends up looking better because it was an absolute blowout. And you need a bunch of things to break your way for it to be a blowout. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're you're playing better. It's just that things shook out a little bit differently for you, which in the Packers' case ended up shaking out really, really well. Um, so I don't think it was necessarily their very, very best game. But I think the best way to, to replicate a game like that is to make sure that you continue to add talent. And that's really what this draft is going to come down to. They've got a really solid base here. They've just got to add team or add guys to that. Ted H. asks, uh, basically, what do we think the Packers are going to end up doing? And my question is, who is your favorite draft prospect do you think has a realistic chance of being drafted by the Packers in the end of, end of round one? Um, I like Graham Barton a lot. I don't know if he's my absolute favorite, uh, but I think he, he checks a lot of boxes for the Packers. May not be just an absolutely elite tackle prospect, but in terms of how the Packers like to, to shake things out on the offensive line, I think it probably would be him um, toward the end of the first round in, in terms of favorite guys. Uh, it seems like as good a bet as any. If you can't get one of the ultra-elite tackle prospects, picks a guy, pick a guy who's solid enough and has some positional versatility there as well. Finally, to end it out, Timothy O. asks, is it me, or did we not get a Ben Wyatt reference this past episode? This was a couple episodes ago, but I'm including it here. It's my favorite episode of Parks and Rec, so I'd love to hear it. I live in Florida, and every time a hurricane season rolls around, the talk is about the cone of uncertainty. I always reference that episode. Thankfully, my wife still laughs at my jokes. Hey, you and me both, pal. Uh, though I have to ask, not not his wife laughing at my jokes, my, my, my wife laughing at my jokes. Uh, though I have to ask, do you want to be a corporal? Or a warrior? A fitting last question. It was indeed a Parks and Rec reference. A uh, show that I enjoy a lot, that we have watched through in its entirety multiple times. My wife, for some reason, sees a lot of similarities between me and Ben Wyatt. If you're a Parks and Rec fan, rec fan you may see, it, see that. I don't know. Looking at him, you see a guy with some nerdy pursuits who overanalyzes everything and has detailed spreadsheets tracking multiple different aspects of his life. Does that sound like me? I don't know. I don't always see it. As to your question, corporal or warrior, there is one correct answer. You want to be corporal or warrior? Neither. I'm the maverick. That's me. I'm your maverick. I don't know. Am I a maverick? I guess we'd have to play some Cones of Dunshire to figure it out. In any case, that's all I've got for you in this episode of Blue 58. I appreciate you tuning in. An extra long episode here for you. It was fun to do. A lot of 
great questions and I appreciate you sending all of them in. And I would also appreciate it if you would share this episode with someone you think would enjoy it. That's going to help more people find the show and get more people involved in this conversation you and I are having about the Green Bay Packers, which in turn is going to help all of us, me included, become smarter Packers fans. And as I always say, smarter Packers fans are better Packers fans and better Packers fans are what we all want to be. I'm your host, John Meerdink. We'll see you next time on Blue 58.